Welcome. Uh, so I'm going to start with a reading, actually, to terrify you with a giant illustration. Uh, Let me try once more, Milo said in an effort to explain. In other words, you mean you have other words, cried the bird happily? Well, by all means, use them. You're certainly not doing very well with the ones you have now. Uh, there's a fantastic book I love since I was little, and it's The Phantom Tollbooth. This illustration is taken from it. The author, Norton Juster, quit his job so that he could work on the book. With the stacks of research uh, that he'd had, he was feeling really burned out and uh, buried under mountains of facts. So he went out to Fire Island, which is actually on the, the end of uh, New York, and uh, thought about an experience he'd had running into a 10-year-old boy in the city. And the, the kid asked, you know, what is the biggest number there is? And Jester stated, when a kid asks you a question, you answer with another question. So I said, tell me what you think the biggest number there is. And Jester repeatedly asked him to add one to the number the boy came up with, leading them to talk about infinity. So this fantastical book gave me an early interest in wordplay, and also how fun but also loaded our words can be. So who am I? I'm Tracy. Uh, I'm currently at Urban Airship. I took my dirigible remote recently and uh, moved across the country via road trip. Uh, I enjoy the conversation that comes with cabin fever and also driving through crazy thunderstorms. So I made that drive in the middle of the the tumultuous summer. Um, and I'm just catching my feet in New York. I moved from Portland. And now I'm trying to decide as an organizer how I can make an impact. So <laughs> use your words. Uh, I was a jerk recently, as it happens. Um, once I dis uh, wised up and knew that I was wrong, I decided, as I do, that I needed to research how to apologize. Um, really, because I've apologized plenty of times, but you know, you'll, you'll see these arguments online where people apologize, and the other person clearly doesn't feel like the apology is real. And I wanted to be sincere. Uh, apologizing is an art unto itself, and the chance for messing up is really big, with the slightest change in wording uh, being the difference. So my argument is this. Whatever we learn has a purpose, and whatever we do affects everything and everyone else, if even in the tiniest way. For whenever you learn something new, the whole world becomes that much richer. So how do we maintain our communities? This is near and dear to me. How do we grow them? How do we help encourage people here now and manage their expectations of what they're stepping into? There are steps that we can take with our user groups, uh, in our conferences, as individuals, that can help support an inclusive environment that allows for debate, growing, and excitement. The social sciences have 100 years of research that can provide us with the tools to treat our fellow programmers with care. Much of this has been battle tested in the organizations we run and passed along through mentoring, uh, the bubbles we live in. I'd like to share how we're creating a better world that is welcoming to programmers new and experienced so that we're leading by example. So why is this important to me? I'm a career transitioner. I was welcomed by kind, patient, and seasoned programmers. And that was not required of them. They could have been, uh, they could have been far crankier, online and in person. Um, they could have been battle-hardened. Uh, these programmers were compassionate and certainly didn't receive the same treatment when they started. There are different challenges to face as a young kid exploring the world bold and excited, unencumbered than when you're an adult looking for a uh, purpose and hoping that your jump to code can help you realize that. I'd like to think that we can all change the world in some way, as an individual connecting with another human or as a leader. Uh, my prior work was in social work, and when I moved over to programming, that didn't stop. I just had a little harder time trying to figure out how I was going to make that relate into the work that I was doing. We aren't all making apps that have these tangible connections to making the world better. I'm not con uh, currently working on a project that helps a person find housing or make sure that they have a meal each day. That doesn't mean I can't make the smallest contribution by helping at least one person's day be a little bit better, or at the very least, not worse. I'm not asking for sanitization of personality or keeping PC. Just be a model of what you want to see in programming. Your world won't, no uh, won't necessarily look like mine, and that's totally fine. 
Uh, we're probably going to butt heads about it. But be kind while doing it. The reason we argue is to be understood. I do a lot of that. And I, when I argue, I'm definitely not feeling understood, especially when I keep going. So let's try and get a little closer to that. It takes support. It takes mentors the whole way down. Today I'm going to feature a whole bunch of individuals who made my life and probably yours without even knowing it far better. If you aren't lifting someone else up in your day, what are you doing? So firstly, I struggle as an individual and as a programmer. So meet Niall. Uh, in November 2012, I was knee deep in the process of becoming a programmer. I had quit my prior career and was furiously learning Python as quickly as I could. After having seen a tweet regarding the company I had been eyeing, uh, sharing that they were going to be doing a hiring bonanza, far before I thought I'd be ready, I became frantic. I hopped on IRC and uh, talked to some of the friends that I had that worked at that company to see if I should entertain the thought, even though I was certainly not brave enough to step into it. <coughs> uh, I had no idea how quickly this interaction would spiral into my blessed current existence. Uh, two of them immediately responded with detailed takes on what I would and would not like about it, um, but what I could expect, and that I should absolutely check it out. So I'll set aside to say this. I used to be that person looking in from the outside, that person who would always look at people with purpose and passion and say, like, how'd they get so lucky? When my partner at the time got a job at Google, we kept hearing this from family and friends, and I kind of took offense to it. I was like, he earned it. But I started to reevaluate. I'm not a person that likes to believe in luck having power over my ability to make things happen. Luck seems silly. Uh, when my friend contacted me about meeting for coffee re regarding my first and current job as a developer, I was prepared for this opportunity, less nervous, because I had worked hard so far. It was a perfect storm in the guise of luck. And armed with a collection of people cheering me on, I got it. So August 2013. And suddenly, a mentor arises. It's that simple. Uh, Rachel had approached me, of all people. I had met her at Beer 2.0 in Portland, uh, which is a networking event meant to expose people in the community uh, to a startup looking to gain exposure. And that month, it was my friend's uh, company's new space, and I was really excited to share in their joy. Uh, Rachel was considering getting her own startup off the ground and was oozing with enthusiasm to talk to people or at least to me. <laughs> uh, she was excited and she wanted to talk code, and I was excited that somebody wanted to talk to me about it, and so we did. And it's amazing how even the slightest bit more experience than somebody else has, uh, considering to have that path can make them feel comforted. Uh, Rachel followed up with me the very next day, she was insistent, and she needed a path. She needed to be able to see a couple months down the road, and she needed to know that even short term she could look towards something just a little more tangible. So we set a coffee date and never looked back. She divulged to me after a few meetings that she, would, she was hoping I'd mentor her, um, that I'd been so supportive. And we all need that. She was genuine and willing to share how scared she was. And I was blown away. I didn't know what I'd be able to offer her. <laughs> I was not that far along in my programming ability, even if I did have a job in programming. Uh, but she was convinced, and I was willing to suspend my doubts <coughs> that I'd be able to support her. Now, someone was asking this of me, and I couldn't let them down. So she inspired me to keep, to keep being helpful on days when I was feeling really useless as a programmer. So what it is, what is the problem? Uh, I am but an individual. I have no place mentoring others. But guess what? You have no idea what people need to hear until you're willing to listen a little, to share what it could be. I'm a coder who carries within me the ability to do superhuman computery things that can change the world. And I can be kind. These words have carried me thus far. So words and encouragement. They can make or break someone. Don't underestimate that. Meet Chris. Chris is speaking next door right now. Chris Dickinson in January 2013. Uh, Chris possesses the uncanny ability to unravel the JavaScript event horizon. When I met him, it was also over coffee, as an interview to see whether he'd be willing to accept endless hours of headaches in translating his brain into words I could put together as JavaScript. 
Uh, he agreed. We were the only JS engineers at UA for a very short time, and he remained my mentor for much longer. He never once condescended me. The patience he kept in the number of occasions where I couldn't even find the words to explain how much I wasn't understanding him <laughs> is something I will be eternally indebted to him for. That wasn't his job. Uh, that was his sanity. And he was so excited about Node and thought it'd be nice for me to try and be able to think purely in a JavaScript context since my prior study had been in Python. Uh, so we made a plan to go to the inaugural Node meetup in town and meet Ben. Ben Acker uh, I met at PDX Node in January 2013. He's a fellow with a boundless amount of energy, smiles, and kind words if you haven't met him. Uh, the, at the, the initial meetup for Portland, he, cre he greeted every single one of the attendees, and I think the count was over 100. There were other organizers there. Uh, I was astounded. It was the first time I'd met him. After speaking with Ben about how many great things we had to look forward to as a group, uh, he asked if I'd be interested in helping organize. Um, and this is another moment where I'm just thinking, people are crazy. Why do they keep asking me to help? Um, yeah, somebody wants me to help. Yes, of course. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, so I ran with it. I helped make sure there were speakers. I attended and announced the meetups. I worked up the courage to give a talk at the first Node conference in Portland, Node PDX. Um, I shared with attendees the fun times we were having and how Node is an awesome space to participate. This is all because Ben asked. He asked, do you know what feels more welcoming to a new programmer to then to be asked to help in some capacity? There's nothing. That's really, there's nothing. Since that January, almost two years ago, there are eight organizers total recruited to that shindig. That little user group grew to more than 600 node friends. We ran an International Node Bots Day Portland within five weeks prep and had over 50 people attend with Arduino kits in every hand and sponsors to boot. Uh, we got people excited about hanging hardware with JS, and that was, <laughs> that was really awesome. You know, now there's a family of organizers and friends in, P in Portland who help support this rad community. People joked about me cat hurting the organizers of PDX Node. It can be stressful. It was always fun. I wouldn't have felt able and welcome if it weren't for Ben. Because of the ask. Because of the encouragement. So what's the problem here? There's plenty of meetups, but they always need heart. It doesn't matter if they've been around for years. And diversity of attendees and a diversity of thought. I've seen many in echo chamber. We need to continue to push ourselves like we do in our code to make ourselves a little uncomfortable in order to grow. <coughs> I started the weekly code and learn and secretly also kvetch uh, for PyLadies in Portland because I'd recognized the need for casual hangout time with those who, attended, uh, who tended to be newer programmers. There were a lot of us who had been trying to break, uh, break into full-time dev work and needed to know we'd eventually get there. Uh, there were Saturday mornings I didn't want to bike out there. I wanted to be lazy. I wouldn't be helpful. But, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that great at Python. <laughs> but I was able to connect those needing help. Let a friend know that the urge to throw her laptop would never go away, but that there'd be plenty of company to empathize. There's a different kind of commitment here. If you're excited, this can be just as huge a time suck as running a conference, especially if you care. It's just a slower burn because it's consistent instead of leading up explosively to one big event. So what it could be. Supportive community that raises, raises each other up, helps network, gets jobs, encourages speaking and traveling, and gives hugs or whatever form of encouragement that doesn't violate your boundaries. <laughs> There's a number of exciting groups that do this. I can tell you about them. You can follow their models. You can change it and make it your own. <laughs> so at the end of this July, uh, my attentions were drawn to a conference that had been many, many months in the making. Uh, Cascadia JS is a regional Pacific Northwest conference that moves between Cascadia and metros every year. And this year, I was asked to spearhead it. On top of the challenges of massive project event management, budget planning, and fundraising, I took this as a way to forge forward uh, with, with creating a conference filled with the type of community I wanted in programming. Diverse, caring, and passionate about coding. 
thanks to my organizing team, many of them I've already mentioned, uh, we moved forward a little bit with this. 14% of our attendees and 11 of our 25 speakers were from underrepresented groups in programming. The conference was a place I got to see meetup organizers I had worked with shine on stage as speakers, as core organizers for this massive conference, and as stewards of our awesome nature. I think the organizers that have given me so much advice, love, and support go far beyond the don't be a jerk that we see so often in codes of conduct. That's the lowest common denominator in my book. <laughs> Meet Carter. So speaking of conferences, let's take a look back at November 2013. I was in Paris when I got the text. It was three weeks after I had attended Cascadia 2013. And I had left exhausted from friending and energized to grow the community. How would I contribute to my home and the tech community I hold dear? Carter would pose a question to me that would offer this at a much larger scale. So to be clear, I thought he was crazy or that I was misunderstanding the question. I had been running one user group with multiple events and hosting weekly hack days at another. Granted, that took up a lot of time, um, but it was not on the scale. Uh, I had put together Hacker Train and Carter's help uh, to lead devs to Cascadia, but Carter was asking me to run the show. So, seven sleepless months later, we had a well-orchestrated circus on our hands, all of which couldn't have happened without Carter laying the groundwork, supporting me along the way, and providing me with a sounding board in place to argue for what I found important and worth fighting for here. And I'm smack dab in the middle of running another conference at the end of the month. Uh, it's people like Amanda, Jesse, and Vance uh, who help encourage others in this excitement and kindness who keep people like me from burning out, from becoming jaded. They are exactly the type of people I hope to get to meet, the type of wonderful humans who should thrive in tech. I never spoke in my own meetups. Uh, you hopefully will see very little of me at the conferences that I run. If I'm, going, if I'm going at my job correctly, you're having a good time not noticing the holes in the boat I'm racing to plug. I'm not there to make a name. I'm there to create an experience. I continue to invest in you, and I get to continue to love my work and my field and the insanely wonderful people I'm surrounded by from those efforts. And it's really self-serving, um, but you know. So let's recap. I was lucky. People took risks on me and encouraged me every step of the way. Again, I was lucky, we didn't have to do that. I could suspend my doubts long enough to say yes and get moving. I'm stubborn enough to carry it through because I don't want to fail anyone. I model what I want to see in the world where I exist. That's an undertaking. It's not easy to fight tiny revolutions. It can feel like a near Sisyphean cause. <laughs> But kind words can be the difference in your day, your week, your month, or whether you can even stick to it at all. I remember the temptations I knew I would face through excuses, or really learning code I knew it would be a challenge, by quitting my job and learning full time. Having spent time in evening coding circles, weekly hack Saturdays, and coffee dates, seeing the different challenges my fellow, my fellow transitioners faced, <laughs> I recognize how incredibly blessed I was to be able to afford this opportunity to myself, and even luckier that I was able to get a job so soon after I made my jump. Our privilege requests of us that we give back to what we've been given over others. I've questioned this since a lot since I was a teenager, uh, that I've been giving gifts and the world demands for me that I pay it forward. It's a lot of pressure. My most recent conclusion on this is that I've received no shortage of good fortune. Uh, I work hard, but I will keep, and I will keep putting my energy into this because it's the least I can do. You mentor as soon as you get the chance. It's mentoring as a, one, you know, one human to another in the form of conversation, as a leader and raising up your community to let it shine. I keep coming back to the notion of all of us carrying some responsibility for the knowledge we have. That from the moment you get a little, you mentor. You answer those questions. You try to be friendly and connect people because you can do that until you can contribute technically or whatever strengths you're building. I like people and I want to shape the future. Many of us will change the world with the tools we create. I've always chosen paths I would somehow see a road of making lives better. Coding can do that. 
Right now, I can make this experience better, so I try. I don't currently contribute to core in a language. I'm an OK programmer. But I'm continuing to get better. I will be great eventually if I keep putting energy into that. So when I ask organizers why they do what they do, what's the consensus? Is there one? What's the motivation? Relevance? Power? A compulsion to help? Many of these leaders have little interest in power, anecdotally speaking. Uh, I don't want to take over the world. Probably do a pretty lousy job at it. I feel responsibility to share my road thus far in the hopes that I can make it an awesome path for others to follow. A few people really went above and beyond to help me into the program community, and it's a blessing I'm happy to pass on. And remember, also, that many places you would like to see are just off the map, and many things you want to know are just out of sight or a little beyond reach. But someday you'll reach them all. For what you learned today, for no reason at all, will help you discover all the wonderful secrets of tomorrow. And you don't get there without a whole lot of help and encouragement. Now, of course, I can't, I can't end this conversation without thanking people who have been really helpful to me. Um, and that's a lot of conference organizers and a lot of people I've left off here. This slide could have been a couple slides in itself. Um, and that's Carter. Uh, that's Angelina, Eric. A lot of these people run the conferences that you've attended and ones that you should attend if you haven't. Um, and then also I have the resources for uh, my good friend Ben, who gave me a couple of the illustrations that I featured on these slides, as well as the rest of the art by Jules Pfeiffer um, that you can find in the Phantom Toll booth. Thank you. Any questions? person so that you have support and you have help. Um, but other than that, there's a lot of tools out there that you can use. Uh, you don't have to use Meetup, but it's made things really easy for you. Meetup.com. Um, using social media to let people know that you're having a meeting is helpful as well. But having a couple of friends who want to meet on a weekly or a monthly basis to get together and just talk about something and nerd out. That's really all you need. And then being able to take advantage of the tools like Twitter and Meetup to make sure people know that you're doing that fun stuff is where I would start next. Um, and, and probably also a variety. You don't have to do presentation nights. You can do workshops. Um, there are, there are a number of resources that have been open sourced. I know Girl Develop It has um, open resources for people to be able to use to run classes. Uh, and then also there's wonderful tools like Node School that um, if you have a couple people who are willing to dig in uh, to learn it, to be able to mentor, uh, you can run one of those really simply. Um, and they're a lot of fun. And then if you're into hardware, that's a whole other level. So. <laughs> The kind of people will show up without you having to advertise at that point. <laughs> yeah? Have you seen any groups fail and without naming names or anything? Can you give me some like, reasons why groups fail? What kind of things are the most common things that groups people just disband and never meet? Yeah, it's a, um, as an organizer, it's a constant frustration. So, burnout? Organizer burnout's huge. And, I've talked to a number of people about that at the meetup level as well as the conference level. And it's, it's really time consuming. Like, I don't have kids. I don't have health problems. I don't have, you know, I'm not a caretaker for anybody. So what I get to do all day is, you know, very self-serving. Um, so you need a support system of people who are willing to prioritize that group that you're trying to work on. I'm not saying that you should sacrifice other things in your life for that. You just need to make sure you have space for it. Um, because someone, I, I, to, I absolutely fall into that group. Um, it's, it seems to be this infectious disease that people who like to organize things will say yes to all of them. And so the burnout can happen. We had eight organizers with PDX Node and a number of them have kids, and we all were full-time developers. And 
when it's shipping season, you know, it's, it's rough. And then at the conference level, that's a whole other thing because you've got the conversation that I had with Carter, my, my con sort of like main conference mentor was, he was trying to pass along his conference, which is a very interesting thing to do. And I don't mean like pass on, he doesn't want any part of it. He founded it and wants to make sure that it succeeds because he loves it and wants it to happen regardless of whether he's there. And that's a very interesting thing because most people I know who run conferences, that's their baby. That's their personality. Uh, and are you going to lose that if you let other people come in? And you might. It, fails because it doesn't fail, but the worry, the, the reason that Carter tried doing that is because his concern was maybe someday I won't be able to do this, or I'll have a health problem, or you know, let's see if we can address this problem before it's a thing. Because you don't want to create, it's not selfish to say, like, I've run this conference for a couple of years, and I just can't do it anymore, and it doesn't happen. But it's a shame for people to not get to experience that if you had something really awesome going. So he was trying to nip that in the bud ahead of time, um, and kind of experiment and see if that was possible. Yeah, anything else? Cool. Thank you, guys. <laughs>